Hi, everyone. Welcome to New Ideal Live, the video and podcast series of New Ideal, the journal of the Ayn Rand Institute. We discuss the complex issues and events shaping our world from the perspective of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, a philosophy that upholds the ideals of reason, individualism, and capitalism. You can visit our publications at newideal.aynrand.org, as you see on the screen. Uh, and you can join the Q&A through Zoom uh, at zoom.us slash join with the meeting ID that you see on the screen there, 812-506-718. And today we're talking about the recent antitrust attacks on big tech. So on July 29, the CEOs of four of the world's largest tech companies were subjected to over five hours of questioning by members of the House Subcommittee on, on Antitrust during a hearing which was called uh, Online Platforms and Market Power, examining the dominance of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Uh, my colleague, Ankar, my colleague Ankar Gatte and I want to talk about the meaning of these hearings and what they subject, su suggest about the future of antitrust legislation and the future of the country. Uh, so Ankar, welcome. Hi, Aaron. Good to be here. Let me stop my share here. There we go. Cool. Yeah. Oh, nice to see you. Um, so for anybody who has uh, spent some time watching these hearings or maybe reading a bit about them, um, I mean, you and I have watched hours of the, this kind of testimony. And one of the things that really struck, I think, both of us was the extent to which the hearings looked less like a hearing and more like a show trial uh, in, you know, in, in the sense of what you might find in authoritarian regimes. I mean, some of the characteristics were uh, it really looked like they'd already come to a conclusion before having the trial. So it, it didn't really look like they were trying to investigate the issue or try to try to reach facts or an understanding they were extremely belligerent toward the, wit the, the witnesses. Um, and the, the constant use uh, of the language of force to talk about business activity. So Amazon has the, their competitors in a chokehold and they're throttling or crushing or stamping out or destroying their competition. Uh, so I think, I mean, that's worth talking about I mean, in the sense that like what's really going on in these hearings. Uh. Yeah, if, if you asked me, like, what did it amount to? It amounted to a show trial. And as you said, authoritarian regimes do this. And what they're trying to do is preserve the appearance of legality, of rule of law. We're guided by the facts and by justice. And here's the trial where everything, everyone has an opportunity to speak, everything is going to come out and we're gonna reach a proper and just decision. And what the subcommittee is doing is they're writing a report about how to either enforce or revise antitrust so that it in quotes continues to promote competition. We should talk about that aspect as well. And you've got four of the most knowledgeable people in the world about the internet, about platforms, about how they work, the nature of the competition in the industry, the, the foreign competition that they face. This was a point Zuckerberg brought up. And, and if you were actually interested in trying to figure out what the law sh should be here. Now, I, I think antitrust should be seen as this is not the rule of law. And we'll talk a bit about that. But if what this committee is about is, okay, you've got new frontiers of technology and so on. What should proper law be here? You've got the most knowledgeable people. You should be trying to pick their brain. And this hearing, I mean, hearing was so much not that. Yeah. It's, it's the newspaper stories are, well, uh, the, the chair of the subcommittee, what's his name? Cicilline. Yeah. Uh, he wanted the input. He wanted the CEOs to have a chance to give input before they issue their report. And whether the report is written or not, what's going to go into the report, they've already decided. And that's the show aspect of it. Like, why did you need these CEOs? You've already got, come to your conclusions, written your report. So it's only to score political points and to try to make the report when it comes out look like oh yeah, this was a lot of fact finding we heard from every side and so on, when you so clearly did not. 
Yeah, and they were they were explicit about that. I mean, they uh, it, not every one of the uh, the people on the committee questioning the CEOs, not every one of them, but m- most of them would just simply say, "We already know you're guilty of anti-competitive practices, guilty of having monopolistic power. We you need to either be broken up." or uh, we need to write new laws or have a new approach to antitrust legislation so we can um, do whatever we need to do with you to prevent you from being, uh, and that's the issue that, the, the, I mean, the, the title about online and market power. I think a lot of the shift was it's about power. Uh, and I mean, we'll talk more about this equation of economic power with political power, with the, the power to trade, uh, with the power to coerce. Um, and that was all through the hearing. But what did you think about, I'm curious what you think about the testimony from the CEOs. I mean, I was most impressed, I think, by Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. In, in terms of the way he comes across with more more self-confidence, I think, l- less uh, hat in hand. I mean, they're all, they're, they're, all of these people are put into a really awkward situation because, I mean, uh, <laughs> the government has the guns in effect and they can they can really cause serious damage to their business. And so they have to be respectful and they're put in a very awkward position where the opposite is the the people questioning them are belligerent, bullying, really disrespectful, cutting them off. It's it's nasty. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah, it's a very difficult situation for them to be in. I wish they were more forceful than they were. I agree. I found Zucker for the the testimony. The, I mean testimony that I watched. I found Zuckerberg the best of the four. Um, but if you think just how impossible a situation it is, like why would you show up? They, I suspect from their demeanor, they knew this is what it's it's going to be like a show trial. Yeah. And so why would you show up? But the, the people invited who don't show up, that's held against you. So I think they brought up Twitter that the Twitter CEO didn't come to this. We invited him. And he didn't. You know, he doesn't have the graciousness to accept our invitation. So that will be held against them when they write this report. And it's like, what do you have to hide that you couldn't even show up to this? Yeah. And then if you show up, you're it's you're part of a show trial where it's you don't really have a, a opportunity to answer the questions. Any time they started to answer in a way that the person asking the question didn't like, they cut them off. It's not oh okay, so you have a different view about this and so. Let's hear what you have to say about it. It's no, I don't like what you're saying. Your answer is I'm going to cut you off. Yeah. And that it's, but they have so much power. I mean, and the whole, the whole thing is a threat of we're going to rewrite the laws. I mean, so laws in bracket, we'll come back to that, but laws and scare quotes, we're going to rewrite the laws to destroy your companies. So you can see some of them thinking, okay, it's probably better to show up than to not show up. But I can understand the people who think, no, it's probably better not to show up than to show up. Because at least, and I actually agree with that. Because at least you don't give it the semblance of this is a real fact-finding mission, and they're trying yeah. to figure out the just course of action. Yeah, and and uh, in some of the reports I read about this, uh, or some news reporting about this, uh, some of them were criticized for sticking to their talking points, but. <laughs> I don't I wouldn't blame them at all for sticking to their talking points. You can go down any one of these rabbit holes that they open up and then in two seconds of explaining something, it's uh, sorry, I have only five minutes. So let's move on to the next question. And they're just waiting for a gotcha for something to come out. Um, But, you know, and everyone, each of the four CEOs, I thought was interesting, is that they brought up um, the relationship between what they're doing in their companies and America. Um, and I think that was deliberate that all of them, each of them brought it up. Uh, and I think that this is an important aspect of, of what they're doing in their representatives of American business. This is what it looks like. Um, um, and, and this is part of to get that this is a show trial and that the the instigators of it. And this is both on the de- demo. I mean, I think the Democrats are leading the charge in regard yeah. to this and antitrust. But the Republicans did nothing and worse than nothing in in um, on the committee. So th- they're from the, again, I didn't watch all six, five hours, but the questions that I saw were all directed, you discriminate against us conservatives and so on. So you have too much power. And if you read the news stories in, the, and, in, in outlets like 
what well, well, I think American Prospect was one of the stories I read. They explicitly make this point that, oh yeah, the and it was put something like the Republican wa Republicans whined that uh, the. And they even brought up Twitter when the CEO is not even there. And I think Zuckerberg said, well, that happened on Twitter, but I can speak to. Um, so they whined about, we well, don't like how you're running your company. And the point they made is, well, yeah, so the Republicans agree that government should control how these companies are run. It's just they were focused on their stupid whining about this when the real issue is they're anti-competitive in a much larger sense. And in that way, the... the this is why they were worse than useless. It's they added to the idea that government should control these companies. Yeah. And it's just a different form of control as we would exercise if we were in charge than what the Democrats want to do. Yeah, and I think that goes to the meaning of this event. You know, I mean, the fact that both um, uh, the people from the, Re the Republicans and the Democrats were both pushing the idea strongly uh, and not just by implication strongly that these companies have too much power, something has to be done. And um, yeah. if you think about, so th this, I think it's important to think of it like this, that a number of the CEOs and their comments, including their opening statements, and again, I think Zuckerberg and Tim Cook were the best on this aspect. These companies compete with each other. So the idea that, you know, okay, we've got these four big- Competing really monopolies, big four competing companies. monopolies. Yeah. yeah, and they don't face competition. I mean, what is the competition in mobile phones operating systems, if not Android versus iOS? That is Google and Apple. Or in text messaging, it's iMessage and then Andrew and then uh, Android and then Facebook is getting in. I mean, it's part of buying WhatsApp and so on. So they're competing in major areas of what we're thinking of, the, of, of this is what they're involved in advertising. It's Amazon, Facebook, Google competing against each other. Google launched, I mean, tried to compete with Facebook, but Google Plus, they're launching that. It's like a social networking. They've tried to get into online shopping to compete with Amazon. So, so like you've got each company has the most fierce competitors that you could imagine. I mean, imagine and the smartest. The, yeah, like imagine you're yeah. Apple and thinking, okay, we're Google's entering our mar market, or you're Amazon and thinking Facebook's entering our market. It's so the idea that okay, what, there's what we have here is like public utilities who don't face any competition. That's a farce. And then yeah. what's the solution? The solution is to turn them into public utilities, and it's. Okay, so the problem is a monopoly. So instead of having private companies making decisions, the one monopoly in the room, which is government, we should be the ones making the decisions. So the solution is we're going to have an explicit monopoly making decisions about all of this. And that's why, like, if so, on both aspects, there's not a problem. And your solution is what you're saying is the problem that we're going to have monopoly control over this. And that's why it's a farce. Yeah. And so <clears throat> what's different about, so there was the case uh, with Microsoft, you know, this is, you know, a decade ago uh, with Microsoft and Netscape and so on. So they, the FTC put uh, Microsoft through hell for a long time uh, for offering something for free. Um, What's different, if anything, between what's going on now? I mean, as we watch these trials and we start to, because they're pushing for either new legislation, expanded legislation, or a different approach to the way they handle it. And there, there's a sense in which, so first of all, I mean, from Grant's perspective, there shouldn't be any antitrust laws at all, that they're inherently uh, unjudicable, they're inherently irrational, contradictory. Uh, and she, she makes these points in her essay, uh, America's uh, Persecuted Minority, Big Business, uh, and elsewhere. Um, but what's different now? Because it looks like they're taking a different tack. It's they're trying to put more teeth into the antitrust laws. I think that's part of the way to think about it, that the um, so the antitrust laws come in the late 19th century with the Sherman Act. Um, they're enforced considerably after World War II against companies. She's, uh, Ayn Rand, as you said, I mean, she was adamant that the antitrust laws are one of the most pernicious laws 
passed by Congress that's destroying economic freedom. And when she's writing in the early 60s, she says, if you're interested in political causes, um, the two things to oppose if you're on the side of freedom and worried about the destruction of freedom are the antitrust laws that are destroying economic freedom and the FTC, which was destroying intellectual freedom. Uh, sorry, it's the FCC, the Federal yeah. Communications Commission that's controlling media and what can go on the airwaves. And at the time, that's radio and particularly TV. Um, that the, the handing the power to government to control these things is an incredible encroachment on freedom. Um, I think what you see, and this is part of what, um, when you think of, we will talk about, about this, the kind of academic intellectual background that's generating these uh, hearings and this whole push, it's that antitrust had lost its force and its teeth to be able to go after and persecute companies in the 70s, 80s, 90s, when the focus became, um, it will be put in different ways, it became on price. And that what's bad about monopolies is they charge high prices and nobody can do anything about it because there's nowhere else you can go. It's, um, and in that way, they penalize, or I mean, it's put as, they penalize consumers, consumers and it'll be put as consumer welfare goes down because these right. high price. And you obviously can't make that charge no. against Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google. I mean, most people who interact with Google, everything's free. Search yeah. engine is free. You use Gmail, it's free. YouTube you is G free. Yeah, everything's free. Yeah. So, and Amazon, it's super low prices. So you're not gonna make the claim that, oh my God, look at the prices on Amazon. Um, uh, Apple is probably the easiest that you could say, well, look how expensive an iPhone is and so on. But, but everybody loves Apple. Yeah. So I mean, if you ask value of, I mean, for what you're it's getting. Apple, like Nike, Michael Jordan. I mean, it's one of these names where it's just, they don't, they don't get the hate from the customers. I mean, the, the whole fan base, let alone just happy customers. I mean, they really love that company. So it's yeah. the idea that these are the villains. It's very. Yeah. And that they're, you, you, know, you as a consumer, you're a victim of these companies. That is, they can't make that argument. And there, there's recognition that they can't make that argument. And in effect, you have one or two choices. You could think. Yeah, okay, look at the enormous productivity that has arisen as a result of the smartphone, of social networking, of information at everybody's fingertips. So you can think of, look at what these companies have done. The idea of going after them, it's ludicrous. Or you could think, no, we want to go after them. We want power over them. So we can't go after them in price. How do we go after them? And the older antitrust um, kind of focus was a lot about the structure of a business and of, it would be put as a market or something, that um, it's, it's uh, I mean, one way it's put, and this is, uh, uh, in, it's throughout the, the hearings, when you at, see the kinds of question they're asking, is the kind of integration in a company. And it's both vertical integration, that it's involved in the product from the very early stages of raw material and then some manufacturing and more business to business trade. And then they're at the point of dealing with the consumer. So there's this whole, and if you think of Amazon, Amazon's a lot from dealing with suppliers to dealing with the end consumer. And so it's, it's too big, but the big here is like a vertical integration, but then there's the horizontal integration. There are platforms, and this is made against Amazon especially their platforms. So all these sellers come to Amazon to sell their things, but, but Amazon is also a player in that they have their own products and they have more of their own products. So they're both a platform, but they're and competing with the people. Yeah. And that's, so they're too big vertically and horizontally, and this is anti-competitive. So we have to, to somehow destroy this. Yeah. So we got a question that's related to, we were talking about the testimony and the, uh, what we thought of that uh, from the CEOs, we got a super chat question from Mary Aline. And she asked, um, what if the CEOs had presented a united front uh, and said, in effect, F off, 
fascist uh, as, <laughs> as Alex Epstein once did. Uh, but what if she? What if they had presented a united front and say, in effect, that look, we don't we don't recognize your ability to do this. Uh, to tell us how to run our businesses, which companies we can purchase, how to structure our businesses, how vertical or horizontal we go. We just, we, and, and I wonder if they talk to each other, frankly. And I, I don't know, maybe they do. I mean, but what, what, what if that, what, what would have happened if that? You need some in, more intellectual opposition to it. So it's true. And it would have been, uh, from a certain perspective, good. If they had been more adamant about, like, don't tell us how to run our businesses. We're facing worldwide competition. And that, again, a point Zuckerberg brought up. It's like, you think the tech industry is only US and we're only competing with US firms and so on. Yeah. That is not, there's a growing uh, um, presence of Chinese firms, for instance, in, in, high, in various aspects of high tech. And it's true, not just of of uh, what Facebook, the competition they're facing is true of Apple and Amazon and so on. So, th but that's insufficient. They would have to take on some of the, the roots of what is generating this and say the ve your very premises are wrong. And one of them is the, the equation of economic and political power. Yeah, that's um, a philosophic so issue. Let's talk about that now. And they would have to name it and they would have to say, what is wrong with this? Um, and you really need, in the end, intellectual backing. Um, Ayn Rand was adamant that, so another thing she was adamant about is that you have, uh, that businessmen and intellectuals work together <clears throat> and that intellectuals should be defending, business, learning from businessmen and defending the productive businessmen. And I think you probably read more stories after, like in the aftermath of these hearings than I did. I read some, <clears throat> but like, what was your impression about how many people were on the side of the, the subcommittee and this interrogation and how many people were on the side of the companies? I found almost none on the side of the company. Yeah, yeah, basically none. I mean, I think that there, there's a, con but see, this is where the blending comes in um, because you, if you can separate out in your own mind, things that frustrate you about a company, like some things you don't like about Amazon or things you frustrate you about Facebook or irritate you or even piss you off about these companies or how you deal with them or interact with them. Well, that's one kind of thing. That's not a legal issue. That's, you know, we all have frustrations with various kinds of companies that we deal with, but that's one thing. Uh, and another thing is antitrust issues where you think uh, they're, they're monopolizing or they're too big or they bought a company and you, th you don't think they should have done that. But I mean, these are pseudo laws anyway, uh, the antitrust laws. And then there are issues where like that are legitimate concerns. People have some concerns about data and the use of data and privacy. And so some of these things are, um, they require a legal framework and there's real thinking to be done about it. And there are legitimate concerns about it, not just from anti-business people, but just legitimate concerns. But the way in which all of these things sort of get blended into one ball, and then it generates a sort of animus against these companies. And it's not properly sorted out, I think. Um, and part of that is the blending of economic power and the political power. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> yeah, and you, so you know, I'm trying to, trying to get my head back to what you asked. You asked about the, uh, the coverage. Um, there were some voices more from the sort of libertarian sort of end that will say that, that these antitrust laws are like really damaging to the economy and, um, but I think what, the, what Rand stands out for is, uh, in this regard, in, in contrast to, I think, some of the more libertarian voices, is that what go, what's going on is a moral outrage. Um, it's outrageous that the most of these, these super productive people uh, that are generating billions in wealth uh, are, and, and are, I mean, people say, oh, yeah, how can I get, a, get along without Facebook or Google? Uh, in many cases, we find them such an enormous value in our lives um, that, we don't want to function without them. Uh, and in other words, they offer us an enormous value. And, that, and for, for that, I mean, it's really a punishing of success. I mean, they're brought, hauled out before here, I think primarily because they're successful, they're going their own way, and they're profiting. And I, yeah. And if you look at the, the <clears throat> history of antitrust, it's th what the, the, the theme that runs through it is 
penalizing the best com companies in America. So it's like, these are the leading tech companies now and among, uh, I mean, two of them are the most valuable companies in terms of market cap capitalization in the US or in the world. They're now being persecuted via antitrust. You brought up Microsoft before when Microsoft was at the head of the tech industry. Um, they, the Justice Department and the government went after Microsoft using antitrust. And if you're thinking of what part of the consequences of this can be, I, I would think everyone in our audience is a user of some subset and probably mo most of them, probably all of these companies, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google. It's, I think the, the damage that was done to Microsoft, it's at least a decade of stagnation from the company. They didn't know how to operate. They didn't know what innovations would be considered anti-competitive and so on. And it made room, no, I mean, didn't, sorry, it didn't make room. It, it, so part of the growth of these other companies is you went after um, Microsoft and you crippled them, but you put the whole industry back. Um, it would have been great to have a, another company that was innovative. Uh, on the scale that Microsoft was operating. So it does tremendous damage. And it, if the more this happens to these leading companies, what you'll see, they won't disappear. Microsoft didn't disappear, but they're going to stagnate. And that means American productivity stagnates in a way that it shouldn't and doesn't have to if we didn't have a government going after these companies. And before that, IBM was, they went after, yeah. when Alcoa was the dominant aluminum producer, they went after them, they went after GE when it was a leading company. The initial kind of trust busting is Standard Oil, which was one of the great companies right. of the late 19th, early 20th century. So it's, and this is, yeah, so as you put it, that. Ayn Rand's view of this is it's morally outrageous that th this is supposed to be a country in which you can pursue success and pursue happiness. And the idea that if you achieve it, the government's going to come after you is so perverse um, that it, I mean, I couldn't, I think you had the same reaction. I found it stomach turning to watch yeah. and I couldn't watch 6.5 hours of this. Stomach <laughs> yeah, I watched about four hours. It's just nauseating, and, and after a while, you start, you get the you get the impression there's no need to watch more, because once you get the gimmick, it's like you know what's going on, you know. And part of you said uh, what'll happen is these companies don't just sort of disappear, but they stagnate. And part of not stagnating is, I think, it, buying other companies. In many cases, uh, part of that is what's about growth. It's about integration. So we got a super chat question that addresses this. Uh, it, uh, he says uh, he or she. Says, uh, they accuse Facebook and Amazon of deliberately destroying their competitors. Note again, destroying. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think the questioner means to imply that, but that's, again, that's the language that they use. Right. Uh, and he says, uh, I have never understood what's wrong with it. Isn't that their job? That's a good question because uh, it, it, during the hearings, uh, uh, they, he made the point, uh, so one, of, one of the people questioning um, Zuckerberg, he says, well, uh, when Facebook recognized Instagram as a competitor, instead of competing with them, they bought them. And you're like, okay, fine, right? And he says, this is precisely what the antitrust laws are meant to prevent. And it's, I mean, it, there, this is what's so frustrating about this. This is what, this is what businesses do. They seek out, they acquire the, the, the mergers, the acquisitions and so on, and it's the way, and. And one of the things Zuckerberg said I thought was good is that Instagram was good and their founders were really smart uh, and uh, that gave the company a great start. But you, you couldn't have known or predicted that this is going to be as big as it is now. But in part, it's as big as it is now, he says, is because Facebook bought it and put a ton of money into it and, uh, and grew it in a way. Um, so now people enjoy Instagram even more. So it's, they, they're offering more and more value in this way. And yet the idea that they would supposed to, well, let's not, and also, did they destroy Instagram, crush them, throttle them? No, they made a purchase. Then they didn't have to agree. Instagram doesn't have to agree to purchase. And I mean, Facebook can, is free to say, well, okay, fine. So we'll produce our own, uh, you know, image sharing um, app or whatever. And okay, fine. Then they can compete. 
or they could buy them, but they bought them on voluntary terms. They didn't have to agree to that. And has Instagram disappeared or has it flourished? Yeah, it's flourished. Yeah. Yeah. And it's even as bad as all that is, it's even worse. And this is the aspect of that how bad and non-objective these laws are. It's no matter what Facebook did, other than just say, okay, we give up and we're going to cash out and we're going to give money back to investors and we're going to close shop. Anything they did would be illegal. So if they buy it, well, that's anti-competitive because if you launch a competing product, so this is what Amazon, it's, you're, you're not buying all these third-party sellers on your site, you're doing competing products. Well, that's illegal. That's anti-competitive. So if they bought them, it would be anti-competitive. If they compete with them, it's anti-competitive. And what this then just gives power to the government to say, okay, everything you do is illegal, but we might permit some of this. And this is the atmosphere then that it's, we have to continuously go to government and beg permission to operate. Because yes, technically what we're doing is illegal. If I buy this company, it's illegal. If I try to compete with it, it's illegal. So, but would you allow me to do this or would you allow me to do that? And that's how you take all the power from private individuals with their private property and you give it to the government. Um, and this is the, the aspect, I think, to think, we put it as a show trial and you put it as authoritarian regimes do yeah. this. It's particularly, no, not exclusively. What, what this is, is this is how fascism grows in a country. Um, that our freedom and, and the American conception of freedom that is at the, the birth of the nation, thinking about the Declaration of Independence, it's to exercise your rights, you have to have the right to private property. If you're to speak, to have the right to freedom of speech, everyone think First Amendment, yeah, we have the right to freedom of speech. If you can't own books, newspapers, a, a blog. An um, apartment. You, yeah, any, like if you can't have any implements by which you speak, you can say you have freedom of spe speech, but you have no property on which to exercise it. So you lose that right. All rights depend on property rights. And there's two ways to destroy property rights. The one is the sort of the more straightforward uh, is the socialist one is we're going to abolish private property. It's going to everything is going to be owned by government. There's going to be one owner. And that's it. And, that, and this is the, the socialist communist slogans was we're going to abolish private property. The more insidious and sophisticated. And so I think in, in more developed countries, the one that's much more likely to take hold is, no, you remain the owner. You're the nominal owner. So Zuckerberg and the shareholders of Facebook, you own Facebook. And Tim Cook and the shareholders of Apple, you own Apple. But we, the government, are going to tell you everything you can do. So you own it, but how you use the property, how you dispose it, who you can sell to, what you can buy, you all have to come to permission to ask us for permission for that. And that's fascism is it's nominal private property, but government still controls everything. And that's it's the illusion of, um, oh, that's still capitalist because there's private ownership, but it's not. And so the spectrum that one end is socialism and the other end is fascism, that idea, which we completely reject, and Ayn Rand completely rejected this, it relies on this, that it's well, doesn't fascism have private property and socialism abolished it? So they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. But fascism does not have private property. It has the illusion of private property. So it belongs here. Government controls everything. And this is what we're seeing is for the major companies and the most innovative, successful companies in the U.S., it's government saying, no, we should control this. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on that. Uh, and now I forgot what I was going to say. Um, okay, we'll move on because I, I had some. Well, more I'll say one other thing about this question because it's a good question. This is. Oh, yeah. Oh, let me let me let me cut. Let me let me jump in. Now I remember what it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so the, I mean, when when you give the government this kind of power, it's also relevant that the, the government, they're not running any companies. 
So they don't have to make business decisions. They, it, so it's, it's the control over other people's business activities without any of the responsibility. So you take uh, you know, um, Zuckerberg or Tim Cook or whatever, and they have a responsibility to shareholders and so on, to growing the company. They're trying to profit on, for their investors and so on. They're trying to build new things. And I mean, we're here at the Ayn Rand Institute, or we're a pretty small shop, so to speak, you know, and we have strategy meetings, we think about what we're doing, the decisions to make, and, you know, and we're not Apple. <laughs> but you think about the large scale, uh, long time horizons, like fierce com competition, you know, uh, and what they have to do, is, and then they're just told, well, okay, you can't buy that. Okay, well, there goes all that strategizing out the window. And what are we, is it great? So now we need to, and they're constantly having to adjust in an unpredictable environment for what, um, uh, for what the government's going to do. And, you know, there's a respect in which the market itself is unpredictable. You don't know exactly what companies are going to come, what innovations are going to happen. But it's, but it's, that's not arbitrary. Um, it's people, new people come in and they produce new things and, uh, you know, but this is the arbitrary government edicts and you don't know where it's going to come from and you don't know what you're going to do. And then you start to be scared to make business decisions, mergers, acquisitions and so on, because then you start wondering and then you start spending millions of dollars that you could be spending in productive enterprises. You start spending them in lobbying Washington because you've got to pay off these people. Otherwise, uh, you know, they'll jump all over you. Uh, yeah. And you they have a big present permission. So, yeah. Because you need their permission. They function by permission. That's the that's the thing. And that's why it's such an aberration to have people say, you know, we tried capitalism and look what happened. Um, and another aspect, so the, the questioner was, it, it was, part of it was, I've never understood what's wrong with like, your after, when you're thinking of a business, I've got competitors, I'm trying to meet the challenge from this competitor. And it, what, like, what is wrong with that? Another element to get how morally perverse the whole thing is, is the double standards involved. And Ayn Rand's very sensitive. You read her writings in general, but if you read them about antitrust in particular, the issue of this issue of double standards comes up fairly often. It, it's one of the worst things morally to hold th that you, so, so somebody has to live up to some standard, but I don't, I'm exempt from it. And for no reason, I mean, it's arbit I'm arbitrarily exempt from it. So they brought up things like, so it's about destroying your competition. All these people were elected. You don't think elections are about, okay, what do I do against my competition? How do I beat my competition? How do I win this election and my competitor doesn't win this election? You don't think they're thinking about their competitors and how to eliminate their competitors? And like opposition an research and you know, try to dig up things and you find uh, scandals and videos. And, yeah. and this is if you, I mean, you could use the language you're trying to destroy your competitor, but this is the, the package deal of, it's one thing if you're going to assassinate the person running against you for not that's using physical force that's power but it's not economic power it's not you're offering values and so on it's you're using a gun to assassinate your competitor that's illegal it should be illegal it should be illegal in elections it should be illegal in business it's a different thing if you're presenting a different platform and saying look vote for me I'm a better candidate and so on, which is the same thing as Google saying, use Gmail, don't use Outlook and Microsoft because we've got better product and so on. It, so it's exactly the same. They do exactly this and yet they want to penalize the companies for doing it. Or if it, they ask uh, one thing that I found just unbelievably infuriating was because of the double standards. Z they asked Zuckerberg, do you copy what other companies do. And in any normal context, I think the answer, he would answer, yeah, of course, we learn from other companies and we try to adopt their best practices. He's scared to say it here yeah. because it's going to be used against him. But if you ask these people running for office, do you copy what your rivals are doing? If they start using social media in a certain way and it starts really working, like Obama did, does something like the Trump campaign think, Okay, yeah, we've got to learn how to use social media effectively. For yeah, of course you copy what other people are doing. So the idea that this is some black market and it's anti-competitive is, I mean, it's again, it's it's a farce. And this is when you see this kind of double standards going on, you have to think 
okay, this is not a real quest to understand, to reach the truth, to reach a just verdict. And then you have to ask, okay, so what is going on if that is not what is going on? Yeah. And so what is, so we talked a bit about um, the respect in which uh, part of the meaning of the events, uh, this event, the hearings and so on, and how they're conducted um, is an indication that we're moving more in the direction of, uh, of fascism. Uh, in and in the sense, not that people are marching through the streets, you know, it's, but the idea that it, it's it's more and more of its government control over, in effect, use and disposal of property, uh, companies. So companies have the responsibility, all the responsibilities for owning a business, running a business, but they have to function by permission, uh, and more and more control over uh, business. Um, but what do you think is, can you say some more about what you think is driving this, some of the intellectual causes behind the scenes? Because, I mean, it's often put as a, this is um, leftists and, and uh, biased media are driving some of this. And you know, we talked earlier about this a bit, and you talked about some of the more intellectual causes that are coming more from academia, more from intellectuals, uh, on which a lot of this is uh, premised, in effect. Yeah. I think if, so if we're, if we're thinking where it comes from and how do you oppose this, the solution, unfortunately, there's no quick solution. It's not, okay, just vote out the particular Democrats you don't like or the Republicans, but that's part of the issue. It's, as we talked about, it's both sides of the so-called political aisle um, are pushing that, yes, government should have this power over private companies. And the most successful companies are the ones that we should exert the most power over. And they're both saying that. So there, this is a consequence of deeper views about um, what kind of power government should have. So there's a real push academically. It, it faces some opposition in academia. So it's not like this is that it's the only voice, but there's a growing voice that we have to revive the antitrust laws and give them more teeth, give government officials more arbitrary power. They won't put it as its arbitrary power, but more arbitrary power over companies to say how you can be structured, who you can buy, what mergers and acquisitions that, that I mean, these still have to go through approval even now, but what they're trying to say is they're way too often approved that you can make, do this merger acquisition. And no, government should be saying, taking much more control over this and saying, no, most of the time we don't like this arrangement or that arrangement, we don't like this structure. So it will be, they already have to, when you get to the size of a Facebook or an Apple or an Amazon, they have to deal with government and antitrust, but they want it, it's much more you have to get our permission most of the time we're going to say no, and the, implicitly it's unless you buy us off in some kind of way or another. So th there's a growing push in the legal sphere, and I think you, you read a number of articles in the aftermath of the, these hearings um, on July 29th, where they're referencing one particular article, which is called Amazon's Antitrust Paradox, which was published in the, the Yale Law Journal in 2017 by Lena Khan, who was still just a law student at the time. Yeah. But the whole argument of this paper is, yeah, we have to revive antitrust and we can't just focus on price because if you look at the prices of, as we talked about Amazon yeah. and Google, yeah. that doesn't look like a problem. We have to focus on mark the structure of these companies, how big these companies are and so on. And this is all anti-competitive is part of the argument. So there's a real push and I, I read one story that said this article by a law student got 146,000 hits. Like this is an article in a journal. So this tells you, <laughs> and you have seen it over, all over in newspaper stories yeah. now. As and the references. This, yeah. And the references to the case. title. Yeah, because there was because there was that book, uh, The Antitrust Paradox, uh, which was very popular in, I guess, the 70s. Uh, and this is a play on that because yeah. it's like... Well, it, this was one major shift uh, in the way in which people think about antitrust, moving it away from, you know, uh, monopolies to consumer benefit and so on. Uh, and then this is, a, in effect, a revised, it's a revised version. It's an update. This is a new way of looking at it. And in many of the articles, you start to see antitrust and paradox in the titles of the various articles that are reporting about this. So it's, it's in the air. And but it, this is the way I mean, this is part of the way in which um, 
intellectuals uh, help shape a culture, and they're often behind the scenes in a way in which their ideas happen, uh, uh, you know, in a law school, in a in an academic journal, and so on. And but people, some people read these uh, and are influenced by them, and they're professors and so on. And this leaks out into other intellectual yeah. channels, and pretty soon people are talking about it. Uh, and the congressmen uh, are referencing it, or at least their aides summarize it, <laughs> and uh, they're using talking points from it. Um, yeah. And if you think of what this article is doing, what it's saying, so if you think of the present time, okay, we've got government officials going after the CEOs and the, our, the best, most successful, most productive companies in America. And then you get, okay, yeah, there's this, this behind the scenes, this attempt in, in law journals and so on to revive, but it's to revive. So you have to ask, like, where did these antitrust laws come from? Because the argument of the paper is we have to go back to how we thought about antitrust in the 40s and the 50s and how courts looked at it and how the um, government regulatory bodies looked at this. Uh, so we, we, it's just, uh, it's like, it's not saying, oh, here's some radical new idea. It's just, let's go back to what, how we looked at things before. And where did that come from? Um, if you go all the way back to the uh, Sherman Act, it's explicit, the equation of political power and economic power. And if this is not broken apart, um, this the consequence is to think that in the name of freedom, we need the government to do this. And this is, and this paper in 2017 by Lena Khan quotes from the, quotes uh, Senator John Sherman when the Sherman Act in 1890 is being passed. This is one of the quotes in the paper. It's this, this so this is Sherman speaking in, uh, uh, as a senator. If we, quote, if we will not endure a king as a political power, we should not endure a king over the production, transportation, and sale of any of the necessities of life. If we would not submit to an emperor, we should not submit to an autocrat of trade with power to prevent competition and to fix the price of any commodity. And then Lena Khan in 2017 adds, in other words, what was at stake in keeping markets open and keeping them free, free from industrial monarchs. What was at stake was freedom. That's what she says, quote, close quote. Um, and that, that's the, a king wields arbitrary power like if you think of Henry VIII, off with your head, I mean, his wives and so on, it's complete total power that he arbitrarily wields. The, the founding fathers are getting rid of this form of government. And to equate a company that Facebook goes from nothing or Apple goes from a garage to, look, I've got all these cool products. Do you want to buy an iPhone? Do you want to buy an iPad? Do you want to get these apps in the Apple store? Okay, if you don't want to, I'll go find someone else who does and wants to buy these products. To equate this with a king who arbitrarily chops off the heads of innocent people and to say, yeah, these are just two forms of the same kind of power, basically, yeah. is such a monstrous view. But unless that's challenged, it, it, this is all over the place that it's, yeah, power. And weren't we trying to rein in power in the American Revolution? So now it's just we're again trying to rein in power without thinking that, yeah, no, economic power and political power are opposites. Yeah. And that, I mean, and I think the, the reason I think people should go look at what Ayn Rand has to say about that particular issue is because it's not obvious. If you put it as, um, I mean, you put it starkly to, to, to really bring it out in relief. It's Henry VIII off with your heads versus you don't want my iPhone, go buy a Samsung. All right. So, and it's like, people can see, oh yeah, okay. That's not at all the same thing. Or they throw you in jail versus you don't want to use Facebook. You'd actually have to call your friends or <laughs> sit down with them. <laughs> oh my God. Right. Uh, they can see the difference on that level. Um, but just when you put um, the point is concentration of power. Just that expression, concentration of power, too much power, that scares people. Um, I think partly because uh, they, they think of it in terms of uh, its authority. Authority to tell you what to do, command you, make your options smaller, 
um, restrict you, throttle you, and they associate that. But there are many respects in which um, that has a hold on people where they're not really thinking that, you know, what Facebook has the right to do is like throw you in jail or, or, you know, kick you out of your house or something. But is there something to the idea that, that these companies have too much power? Or is it really just um, more of the same package dealing or like the, 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 the kind of blending of two things that don't really go together, like economic power, the power to trade and the power of physical force? Um, or is there something to it? I, I think there's more intellectual ideas here that are wrong, that are generating this kind of view and, and um, sort of sympathy to the view, even if they think, well, it's not exactly right. There's something, yeah. it's, there's, there's some kind of sympathy to it. And that's, I mean, one of the major issues is uh, the conception of competition and what competition is, what it looks like when you know there's competition and when you know there isn't competition. Um, so to say that there's an there's a intellectual framework here that's driving this is it's in part philosophical. Um, so there's moral assessments, there's moral assessments of businessmen suspicious because they earn a profit yeah. and that like you're making money, but isn't money the root of all evil and isn't that selfish? And the, so there's that aspect. Then there's the blending of economic power, political power, which is a kind of issue in political philosophy. So there's moral issues, there's political philosophy issues, but there's also economic issues. And there is unfortunately in the economic literature, a kind of view that it's probably the dominant view of competition where what competition is and what it looks like is a whole bunch of little players who don't have any market power. And the way that the market power is translated is they can't have any impact or influence on prices. They don't create whole new markets. They're just these little teeny weensy things that take their price. They're very passive. They take prices. They're all basically the same. So one's not better at advertising than the other. So, so if you think like you go into a very small town and there's three or four restaurants scraping by, that to them is that's what competition looks like. And when if you get to any kind of situation where there's just a few big, really successful, really profitable players and so on, that is a symptom of it not being competitive. Um, and this, it, that's just not true economically. I mean, you can become the dominant player. Like, like if you take Apple of going from close to bankruptcy to the most valuable company, I mean, for a period, it was the most valuable company in the world in terms of market capitalization. It did that by offering incredible products, innovative products, products, as you said earlier, that people love. I mean, it had such a fan base yeah. to, to Apple. People are put off by that. Some people use Android just because they don't like this whole <laughs> fanboy atmosphere. But that's a symptom around. of the, val the fact that they offer a value. Yeah. yeah. And that is, um, you can have a super innovative, super competitive market where you have one or two dominant players because they're just so good. But this is where the equation of economic power and political power comes in. You have to ask the question, how did they get to that position and how would they lose that position? And the superficial similarity is what monopolies are and were traditionally conceptualized. It's when government gave a special privilege yeah. to one or two firms and to say like the East India Company, but th there's a whole bunch of examples like this of you've got an exclusive grant. You're the only one who can operate here, trade here. If anyone else comes in, we Please. the government are going to stop them. We're going to and ultimately, that means we're going to put them in prison if they continue to try to encroach on your market. So, so you have one player there. But the reason you have one player there is because government has precluded others from entering the market. It's not as all the same as you have a, a few players like Google and Apple, say, in mobile phones and operating systems, because they're so much better than everybody else. 
And if someone can come along and figure out a way to do things better, they will eclipse them. And not that, it doesn't take that much time. If you look at Facebook going from nothing to the, the size it is, it offered something radically new that people said, yeah, I'm gonna start using that instead of these things. Um, so it's, it's how did they achieve that? You can't judge competitions a process. You can't just take a snapshot and say, there's two big companies, so that's anti-competitive. Yeah, because also once you, and you talk about a process, once you pan back and you look not at what's the situation right now, uh, but stepping back five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and you watch the many, some of these companies don't exist anymore. They were uh, the market leaders and now they're, they're way they're stragglers now. Uh, I think Zuckerberg brought this point up once. Yeah. He said, just look, I think it was the last 10 years or, or whatever. He said, look at the top uh, top 10 companies. Only three of those are still in existence. Or this, only three of them are still on that list out of the top 10. Uh, the idea that once you get, you know, some kind of a economic power that it's sort of, it's static in some way, I think doesn't make any sense. And is it also um, fewer and fewer of those companies are American companies. Many of them are Chinese companies. So you also get competition from abroad. So you can look at Google and uh, Apple and Facebook, but you have to look at all, uh, other companies uh, from abroad that are competing. I mean, in many cases from China. Um, I guess we're running out of time here a little bit. Um, yeah, are there any other questions we should try to get to? And let me look quick. Uh, let's take a look here. I mean, the question that Deb asks, um, why did those testifying not question the question? Um, clearly the premise of the hearing was that there is no competition, yet all these companies compete against each other. The questions posed reflected a fear of power rather than any actual problems or damage that were done. And I think to the point of why didn't they question the questions, in some cases they did. Yeah. In some cases they would say, wait a second, we compete against each other. Uh, and I don't think that's that hard uh, for, o for other people to see. Um, and so some days they did, but on the other hand, they're brought before the Inquisition, so to speak. And well, why didn't they question the in Inquisitioners? Well, it puts them in a danger, more danger. And so I, I get frustrated. I, so Deb, I agree with that. I get frustrated with like, why don't you push? Why don't you say something? Why don't you stand up for yourself for Christ's sake? And on the other hand is, well, they're put in a position where that just puts them into more vulnerability versus putting them in a better position to defend themselves. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And you could see the kind of bogus deference and it came across a bit as well. Yeah. With all due respect, when they- That's a stupid question. Respect, yeah. <laughs> and and to, to go back to, to that, this is what you're seeing is the rise of fascism. Um, there was an episode that's worse than what these trials were happening in Hong Kong now, but this is the road that we're on. And it's not, you can hope that CEOs, some would have kind of the moral courage and certainty to question this, but you should not rely on that. If there's not people, including intellectuals, but if, if the, the, the the Congress men and women on this panel, if they didn't receive thousands of emails and letters just from citizens saying, I regard this as a moral travesty that you're hauling our most successful people and interrogating them like they're criminals. And it's like, you should be ashamed of yourself. It's not just for the CEOs to do that. And if there were more people doing that, you could then think, well, it's more likely that a CEO might then make that same kind of stand. And just this week in China, um, the newspaper publisher Lei, who's one of the critics of the Chinese government, he's pro-press freedom and so on, he's arrested by the authorities. And this is because he doesn't kowtow, he doesn't placate and try to please them. And it was a whole show atmosphere to it. I don't know if you watch, I watched it um, on the news of it. So they're filming 
the the policemen and Chinese officials going in, rummaging through the newspapers' files and getting their computers. They haul off the publisher, very prominent, to put him in the police car. He's arrested, and that's sending a message yeah. that it's this is what's going to happen to you if you oppose us. And the reason they want to haul the most successful CEOs is if they capitulate, then it sends the message like this will happen to you and these are billionaires and they can't do anything. Who are you running some mid-sized company? Who are you to oppose us? And yes, you can wish the CEO stood up more, but if you don't stand up and be on their side and in some ways be the voice that they don't have or don't have the courage to have, you can't expect them to do it. It yeah. can't just be four CEOs and the rest of the country is either doesn't care or thinks, yeah, they're big and I didn't like what Facebook did last week. So maybe they should be in jail. Yeah. So. And that's the whole a republic if you can keep it. I mean, they're, they're, it really is. If you can keep it, it means you, the citizens, and you have to take an active role. And if you don't do anything and, and it's part of the division of labor, these people are running global companies. I mean, it's like the idea that they're they're also going to do their philosophy homework and advocate for themselves while they're being put in this position somebody else has to be their advocate as well yeah. um so sadly we are out of time so i want to do a screen share and share some of the resources uh that you might take a look at um if you yeah, just before that i we didn't get to all the super chat questions but thanks for them and thank you for the contributions as well we really yes thank you it. definitely so let's see here one of the articles that we discussed. Can you see that? I don't see it. Oh, yeah, you, you won't see it. <laughs> um, no, I should well, see it, I think, if you do a screen share. I, should I think so. It, yeah. Maybe I didn't hit the button. There we go. There we go. Um, yeah, one of, the, one of the articles that uh, we're drawing on is Ayn Rand's essay, uh, America's Persecuted Minority Big Business, where she discusses the irrationality and injustice, or what she takes to be the irrationality and injustice of antitrust laws. And also the widespread economic, uh, the equation of economic power with political power. So you can find that in her book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Um, and if you want to just uh, get a flavor of the way she approaches or thinks about antitrust laws, uh, you can simply go to the Ayn Rand lexicon entry for antitrust laws on our website. Um, other works we mentioned today will be added into the program notes, so you can always check them out there. Uh, if you've enjoyed the content today, consider subscribing to ARI's YouTube channel and remember to click the bell to get notifications. And if you're listening on the podcast, you can subscribe there as well and tell your friends about us or anything you, anyone you might think is interested in the context. So let me go ahead and stop the screen share and bring Ankar back. So time to say goodbye to everybody. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks for your questions. <laughs>